Newcastle's there, Billy Head, the goal, Chris Billy Huddersfield Town, the most famous goal of Chris Billy's life. Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. Champion Steve Simonson's boots now. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the frame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Huddersfield Town are promoted. Stephen Schindler. A chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance! Right, so we're moving into the uh, the Worthington period now, town's third manager of the season. Um, and I'm joined by the finest goalkeeper to come out of Kirk Burton. It's Phil Senior. How are you doing, Phil? Kirk Eaton, Matt. Kirk Eaton. I get that wrong every time, don't I? We do it's this Kirk, all the time. It's a Kirk thing. There's too <laughs> many Kirks in Huddersfield. It's Captain Kirk or what? Captain. Anyway, Kirk anyway. Eaton. What's the difference? Kirk Burton's where Danny Ward lives, isn't it? Is that yeah, where Danny kind of, Ward yeah. lives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 that end. yeah. That's... We're, we're yeah, a bit close yeah. to the time round. All merges into one. Uh, yeah. Right, so Phil. In this section, we're going to look at John Worthington's time as head coach. It's quite a short period, but also quite a memorable one, I think, for plenty of reasons. Um, and we'll pick it up from when Darren Moore left the building. Uh, Worthington didn't really mince his words, did he, in his first press, first press conference? I think he was as kind of respectful as, as he could be, but also as aggressive as he could be in terms of saying that the players needed to change their mentality and you know he was going to sort of if you know mix things up and it was quite interesting wasn't it that first press conference because he, he clearly didn't want to bury Darren Moore because Worthy's not really that sort of guy is he uh so he didn't want to bury Darren Moore but he did want to sort of say right things are going to change now and we're going to be much more aggressive and it was a really sort of interesting uh step change wasn't it from from Darren Moore's passive nature to this ginger angry knee-high tackling midfielder that we that we knew and loved from uh, the mid-2000s yeah, I think the I think one of the biggest things that, that stood out was the fan in him. You know, you could really see we're passionate for Huddersfield, and 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 I think it was quite a difficult time because Worthy obviously his his kind of relationships with some of the players would have been a lot different. So he would have had that relationship in terms of um, there's no stress of him being a manager and telling him what to do. He was in in and around the club with them. He would speak to them every day. So I think you'd probably see that he was torn between the fact that. He knew that they had a lot of good quality there, which he, which obviously he saw day in day out, but also knew that these players needed to improve the performance. Um, and it's okay talking about managers and styles of play and things like that, but end of the day, it's down to the players to perform the pitch. And I think that's what Worthy knew um, was was the key ingredient really to getting a little bit of success back. So we saw this change in mentality really early doors as well. His first game up in charge, and it's a huge one against Sheffield Wednesday, and. <sighs> It's it's one of those. We're probably going to mention this has probably been mentioned all the way through this podcast of must win, you know, pivot pivotal games and must win games, etc. Um, but where this first game was a real sort of must not lose game against Sheffield Wednesday, and Reese Healy went off injured early on. Town had t- terrible luck with injuries all the way through. Boyan followed quickly, and which meant that he had to throw Josh Caroma up front, and it and it worked wonderfully well, didn't it? Because Town sort of aggressively pressed from the front. Uh, I really harassed Sheffield Wednesday into a number of mistakes. And we could see that John Worthington personality that you saw as a player, um, you know, in the Peter Jackson era in particular, come through uh, and his imprint on the team. And that's that that change really swung that. And it went from a, a cagey nil-nil town on the front foot. Don't get me wrong, but it was cagey still because it was nervous. Um, but all of a sudden, town Matos made a huge difference in midfield, breaking things up. And Ben Wiles makes a great pass to Josh Caroma, uh, and he goes through and slots it past the keeper, and, and it really opens the floodgates. And Town were absolutely magnificent that day. Yeah, it was almost as if everything just came into place, didn't it? Um, those early injuries were were unfortunate, but I think it's you know a case of you know where they wanted to press out the pitch, and, and it like you said, when Josh came on, it really worked. Um, that pace up front, you know, we've seen it in the past. It, it's it's devastating against teams, and and just finding that little key to unlock them, like Wiles did. Um, can be the difference between winning and losing. Um, 
again, like you, you mentioned, Matos, it's a worthy type of player, you know, someone who's going to get around the pitch and work hard, put some big tackles in. And and I think obviously Worthy, you know, he, he, he said in his press conferences that he wanted to make it really simple. And and it was really simple. It was yeah. to work hard, to press high, yeah, and to express yourselves. That that's literally that's literally what it was. And you could you could almost see the togetherness on it. it was only one game, but you could see a little bit of togetherness and on the pitch with the players, um and, and things, you know, things looked like they kind of gelled a little bit um just through just through where where this sheer kind of, you know, um, will and, and, and love of the club, uh, and it and it was great to see, and I was so pleased for him. Obviously, that first game, you know, as as, as a mate, you want to see him do well, but you know how much it means to him. You know, he, he supports the club just as much as I do, and it's you know, it's, can you imagine a massive thing to to take charge of that team and, and and to get a win? You know, it must have been absolutely over the moon. Yeah, the celebrations were brilliant. You know, him on the pitch afterwards, you could see his delight, and I think his family were there quite close as yeah. well. And I think you had to be sort of made of stone not to. Uh, not to be really pleased for 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 him, um, you know. Yeah. You know, a lot of appearances for Huddersfield and club captain from a really young age as well, twenty two ish, wasn't he? When he yeah, only young one day, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, over Boothy as well, you know. Yeah, um, well, I mean, it's easy to um, easy to captain Boothy. He just, um, <laughs> you know, he's, he's such a good player. So, but but Boothy yeah. was brilliant. We, we were at that time because yeah. obviously he knew he was a young captain. So there was a lot of really good pros around at that time. Uh, you know, Stevie H, he was all them lot that. That really supported him with that, and and, I, and I'm sure he, you know, in that first season, he learned a lot. And you know, we went through quite a lot of tough, you know, tough times in, in that period. And um, you know, it's no surprise that he held himself as well as he did in his first press conference, um, because he is a leader. Yeah, absolutely. And and that kind of carried on into the next week as well. We we played Southampton away, and this was. I know we lost the game, but it's probably the best game of the season in terms of goals, action, and everything. It was it was a phenomenal performance from Town, and we were ten minutes away from probably the best Town performance away from home since uh, Carlos Coburn was at the club, maybe, or maybe there's one or two Neil Warnock ones in there from from last year, which were pretty decent. But it was it was so good because Town were really aggressive, really front footed, and you know really harassed um, Southampton, and you know. When Southampton came back to make it two-two, you just thought, right, this is they're just going to roll over us now, you know, because the Scott Joe Rothwell scored a, a phenomenal volley. I don't know mm. if you remember that volley; it was unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable goal, which you can't legislate for. It just, you know, if, if you just have to kind of applaud that. And then the other one, I think, was a a deflection off Tom Lee, so it was really unlucky because yeah. I think, I think uh, it was Nichols wasn't in goal was going to save it, and then it, it, Tom Lee is just a split second away from making a brilliant tackle. Uh, if he doesn't. Then Nickel saves it. It's just one of those things. And at that point, you're thinking, what have Town got about them now? And yeah. we, we've, I've talked to with with some of the other guys about mental frailties of these players at times during the season, but not on this not on this occasion. This occasion, they really rose back and they they came back at Southampton. And Matos got a lot of luck with that goal, but it was deserved yeah. because Town came back at them. I think Hogg had a chance as well in that game, and you know, so we could have made it three two before. So it wasn't a case of. Uh, we come back against one of the best teams in the division who have ended up being promoted and then rolled over and died. We, we came back at them and that was what I loved about yeah. that game. I know we lost the game and yeah. there's not a lot to love about losing, but it's the fact that we came back and we didn't take any shit from a big club, you know, a big side in that division and a talented side. And real, and that was for me, the, the mark of John Worthington, if you like, in that is that, it was the little guy, the five foot seven midfielder, and he just he stood up and went, "No, you're not. We're not. You're not having this easily." And Town were just ten minutes away from a, an unbelievable uh, performance, and unfortunately, Southampton pulled away. I think Tom Lee's had some, some more bad luck, didn't he? In in link, but he was yeah, he was he was great that day. But he unfortunately scored the own goal, and it happens, doesn't it, as a defender? Um, but for me, that felt like Town were really on an upward tra- trajectory at that point. I felt you know there was you know we beat Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, gone to Southampton, really given you know, really put it to them, and then you're thinking everything's fine here. Um, and then the midweek game comes up against Sunderland, and you kind of see Worthy's um, is not just a one trick pony in terms of the front foot stuff at Sunderland. With Sunderland, we had to sit, we had to sit off, we had to, uh, we had to contain at the points, you know, and, and close a lot of gaps. And we saw a lot more to John Worthy and then. Than what we did uh, against uh, Southampton, where I think he maybe got a little criticism for not shutting up shop at three-two with fifteen minutes left, which is easy to make, isn't it, when you lose the game five-three? But well, I was just going to mention. I was gonna mention yeah, 
Because well, if, if that was another manager, it'd be interesting to see what the the, the outcome would be from that game. And, and and from what you obviously said, and you're right, you know, they showed that fighting spirit to never give up. Um, and, and and I spoke to Werner. We had a really good chat after after that game. Uh, so I'm down at the training ground and he just mentioned the players' legs had just gone. And it wasn't a case of what, whatever they could do. If, even if you were showing up shop, there was still a lot of tightness in those legs through... And, and obviously the things have come out through a lack of fitness. Um, mm. And, you know, it, it, maybe it's not the player's fault. It, maybe it's the training regimes previously. Um, but but he tried his best to kind of be positive. And, and I think on reflection, it'd be interesting to see how Worthy, you know, would kind of approach that again. Because, like he said, the players, the legs are gone. So sometimes even if you're trying to sit back and, and, and defend a lead or a draw or whatever... You're still susceptible to to those breaks and, and to a little bit of bad luck here and there, and that's what they had, didn't they? Yeah, and Southampton. Look at the Southamptons. Not not just their team, but the players they brought on. I think they brought someone yeah. on that cost like twenty million quid, didn't they? It cost more than yeah. all of our team combined. So, you know, you have to kind of put things into context a lot of time. And and I think the reason why he, he changed tact a little bit against Sunderland. Sunderland were on a bit of a dip at that point because there was a whole Mick Beale thing, wasn't there? Yeah. And I, think, I don't know if that was the point where his burner account, burner Twitter account, had come out praising himself, which was which is phenomenal reading if you ever read that. Um, but we had because of the tightness, and this is a midweek game as well. They had to kind of like stand off a bit and had to contain and had to slow things yeah. down and try and contain the pace of the game, you know, and not let the pace of the game become too much early. Um, which I thought they did really well, and and honestly, at, at this point, you're thinking this this is this is great here. You know, you're thinking this is great. You know, you've got a, a guy who bleeds blue and white. You know, in the dugout, you've got a team that seemed refocused, uh, and then the whole game came, and the whole and Hull, to be fair, just did a really good job on us, didn't they? And that, this yeah. is worth his last good game. Team. Hull Hull finished seventh, a good team. And it was it was a little bit cruel that they scored in like the ninety seventh minute, which was added on time from them time wasting, which was which was kind of like a really cruel twist. I think yeah. a draw would have been fair in that game, but you know, I don't I, I don't think we came out of that game with without or with less credit than we went into it. Yeah. If that makes sense, I thought we, I think Hull worked out how to play against us quite well, but I think Rosini is a good good coach, isn't he? And again, you look at the players they've got; they've got Greaves at the back who scored twice, who's might get a move to the Premier League this summer for a lot of money. Yeah. And, you know, they had a really good side. And I think what we saw in those four games, and it was only four games he was there, I think Worthy showed what a valuable asset he is to the club, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, we, it, whether he's, you know, sort of a Jerry Murphy replacement, if you like. Cause Jerry Murphy always used to be parachuted in when you needed him, didn't he? And he would always always come up with the goods with Jerry. And maybe we've got someone in John Worthing and whereby, He's uh, someone when you're in trouble, you can parachute in for a period of time, and he'll he'll sort you out, and then go back to the day job, maybe. Well, I mean, I think I think it also shows as well that you know there were the, a lot of players, and rightly so, got a lot of stick last year for 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 not being good enough, uh, and and a lot of fans questioned the quality of the players that we had in our squad, etc. Um, but where they got a bit out of them, didn't they? So they, they can't have been that bad. Do you know what I mean? He's not a miracle worker. You know, he's just someone who probably instilled a little bit of confidence and a little bit of belief back into them um, and probably kind of understood them a little bit better, made made things simple. So it was, it, for me, it was a really interesting time because, you know, it, it probably highlighted what we found out uh, from Brighton Writer at the end of the season that there were probably some issues in that squad with, with, with a few players and where they will have seen that, he'll have known it 100%. 100%, you know, we, we've been been at this club for a long time and you know when there's, there's bad, you know, if there's bad eggs there and, and, and we also know how to deal with those people as well when we were there um, because we had a few um, and, and that'll be his first target to get these players playing and he did. So all these questions about players not being good enough, etc. I, I didn't really buy into it because you can still get a tune out of players uh, like Walnut did, like where they did for, and I know it were only four games, but, you know, you, you saw the difference big time. It's about how you manage them, isn't it? And he, he did, that, did that really yeah. well. Um, yeah. Should the club have been a bit more persistent in asking him? I know we, we can say this in hindsight, and some people will say it was the right decision, some people won't, and that that's fine. There's there's no right or wrong answer here, but should the club maybe have asked him to stay on till the end of the season? I know he didn't really want to do it, but could they have just sort of like gone, oh, no, there's no new manager this week, carry on, John. <laughs> and just, and, yeah. just kind of, and, and how would that have looked? Because... 
I think with players, you tend to get that honeymoon period with players, don't you? I think they were all quite happy Darren Moore had gone, and you get this honeymoon period where they lift the game a little bit. But you got, you got that with Brighton Writer as well, and then they kind of dipped back to familiar levels. I mean, would that have happened with Worthy, or could he have managed them? It's an interesting, yeah. interesting sort of thing to think about, isn't it? And you know, I'm not I'm not saying we should he should have got a five year contract as manager or anything like that, but I'm just you just wonder whether he. Um, you know, or how it would have looked if he'd have stayed till the end of the season. I mean, it could have been the same result, or it, could, it might not have. But do you think maybe, in hindsight, and I know everyone's wiser in hindsight, it it would have been better if he'd have stayed till the end. I just felt like there was a little, quite a little bit of a, you know, a, an understanding within the players there and the, the team spirit. You know, we always talk about team spirit, but we the togetherness on the pitch looked a lot better. Team players seemed to understand the role a lot better. Um, we seemed a lot more compact. We seemed to have a little bit more of a game plan. You know, I love the fact that we started turning the ball a little bit more and, and pinning teams in and using using Bergsorg and the quality that we, you know, you know the, the quality that we had uh, up top. So I don't know. I don't like to. I, I don't think it's an easy one to say whether we would or we wouldn't have done any better. Um, all I know is that it, it had given hundred percent, and I know, I know for a fact that those players that would have worked as hard as it could for him. Um, and try and done the best for him because he was well liked, wasn't he? Um, yeah. And obviously well understood. I think maybe they, maybe he's uh, he's he's got a he's got a really good standing. I think with the fans was worthy. I think he had anyway, yeah. but I think it's I think it's gone up another notch yeah, after yeah. what he's done what he's done this season. And I think maybe for him and his um, his standing, I think maybe yeah. it was the, it was the perfect time to step out. And like he's not now, we're still no, he's not <laughs> no, he's, he's not. Maybe, he's maybe he's so. <laughs> Maybe he saw these things and thought, mm, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. um, you know, I don't, I don't fancy this. But you know, <laughs> it was he, he did a great job. And what we do, Phil, is uh, during these things, uh, we always have awards, don't we? And I, and I know people be like, oh, you shouldn't be having any awards for, you know, a season where we got relegated, etc. So we made some of them fun. So it's more of a best of a bad bunch kind of. How can you not have awards just because we've we've gone down? Because people, because people are sulking. That? I know. I, I wow. still think. I saw people say you shouldn't have a player of the year, and I'm like, well, oh. that's not really fair on the the odd players that have actually played really well all season. Um, yeah, because they've all they've all actually meant to go down, haven't they? Yeah, yeah they started so. the start of the season and thought, Do you know what, let's all get relegated. Yeah, it's it's as bad as sort of saying, oh, give it to the fans. You know, I always think that I always sort of roll my eyes a little bit at that one. It's, all, it's, it's, it's all right. It's all right saying that these these players don't care, and and, and I, I get it to a point, but it's on your resume is that you've gone down, you've been relegated. Yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So it's still I mean, sticks some do, that. some don't. Yeah, some yeah. some will, some won't. It's. Yeah, exactly. I, I definitely think some of those players definitely did. You know, definitely did care, and you could see yeah. that when we got relegated, there were definitely some. Uh, you know, there's no one. No one's going to tell me that Jonathan Hogg didn't care about whether Huddersfield Town stayed up or went down. You know, I want. I dare anybody to tell him to his face that he didn't care about just whether Huddersfield Town went up or down. There's a challenge for anybody that that wants to get a black eye. Uh, right, so we'll do the manager of the year award. Uh, Phil, uh, mm. this is a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek award, really, because the town have had so many managers in the last in the last two years. Yeah, we can actually have our own manager of the season award. Yeah. Um, so there's four choices. We've got Neil Warnock, uh, one two, drew two, lost three at one point one four points per game. Uh, Darren Moore, one three, drew eleven, lost nine at zero point eight six points per game. John Worthington, one two, drew none, lost two at one point five points per game. And Andre Brighton writer won two, drew five, lost six at 0.84 points per game. Uh, surprisingly, Brighton writer came in lower than Darren Moore, which I think might surprise a couple of people. Um, but it, one, that, yeah. yeah, so we've put this to obviously the vote, and thank you to everybody the two, uh, you know, a uh, couple of hundred people who've voted for this, uh, which is which is a great response in such a tight time scale. I gave people it was. You know, I threw that out late, and I do appreciate people taking the time to vote in this, so we can do do these things. Phil, uh, manager of the season, not one person voted for poor old Darren Moore, uh, which not really surprised. Not one person, not even Darren Moore voted for Darren Moore. Um, we've got three votes for Andre Brighton right here at one point three percent. I mean, Andre, I think had to probably put up with a lot more than the other three. I would, I would imagine, because. When thing when the when the I think when things become clearer towards the end of the season, I think that's when you know your your wheels come off, isn't it? And that's what yeah. that's obviously a lot difficult, uh, more difficult to manage. Uh, in second place with eighteen point two percent is Neil Warnock. 
and with a resounding 80% of the vote, the Huddersfield Town manager of the season is Jonathan Worthington. And I can't, it, quite, yeah, I can't quite show you this in terms of um in terms of the uh Google forms that I've used, but Google must have known because it's given John Worthington's pie chart colour a ginger colour, and that wasn't even me. So <laughs> well, well played Google on that one. So it's 80%. AI, isn't it? Exactly, AI's it's taking over, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. Uh maybe AI will be able to tell whether you went to Kirk Eaton or Kirk Burton. Um <laughs> well it's yeah. not surprising, is it? It's not surprising at all. I, I think know. worthy I think you brought that little bit of feel good factor back, didn't he? Fans kind of, you know, can can respond to him, they, they understand him. He's one of he's one of their own. Uh, we've got a couple of wins, things seemed a little bit rosier, we started attacking teams more, games looked a little bit better. So you, you can't be surprised because the rest, you know, I don't know what happened with Neil Warnock. Obviously, that might come out a little bit more in, in the wash. Uh, but the other two, were, we just weren't good enough, were they? No, things, things didn't go quite to plan, did they? No. Um, one thing that did go quite to plan and sort of catching the eye at this time was Brody Spencer. Um, he played four different positions across the back. You know, in a back three, he played right centre-back, left centre-back. He played right back, left back in a four. And he's played both wing backs as well. Um, incredible adaptability for a 19 year old. Um, you know, he, he got sent out to Motherwell at the start of the season and apparently did quite well there at, at sort of left wing back mostly. Yeah. And he came back and he, he, he marked uh, Jack Grealish out of the game, didn't he? At Man City. I don't know Man City beat us 5 0, but Grealish didn't really get much of a kick thanks to Brody Spencer. And he was so good. He was phenomenal, wasn't he? Especially at the start. And I think. Maybe he might have been dragged down a little bit towards the end. Not not saying he was poor, but maybe the performance wise, he, he kind of got dragged down with others. Um, you know, maybe pulling him down if you like around him. But he was phenomenal from January to the end of the season. And it's it, what a, what a prospect Huddersfield Town have got there, Phil. You know, moving into League yeah. One, it might be difficult yeah. to hang on to him. But really, if you're Michael Duff now, you're thinking right. If I can keep Brody Spencer, he needs a new contract, by the way, because I think it's up in twelve months. If you can keep Brody Spencer, that's that's your cornerstone of your defense. If he's happy to stay, that's the cornerstone, isn't it? And you build around Brody Spencer, and your whole system would probably come from where you get someone, or where you would play him and, and get the best out of him, because it's a special player, isn't he? Yeah, I think it, I think he suffered towards the end of the season. I think he was asked to play again a number of different positions, which I know he can. But when you're playing in front of, or be, sorry, behind a number of different players yeah. who maybe aren't in form, it's really difficult. Uh, you know, it's quite an isolated situation out wide and, and obviously there's a lot of quality in, in the championship. So no matter how quick you are, no matter how good you are, sometimes you know players are going to have the day against you. So um, yeah, he didn't he didn't finish it as well as what he started. But I'm, I'm excited to see what what we're, what else we can get out of him, and I'm excited to see if he can form a partnership with someone because. That's when we really do well, when we've got a right-back, left-back, um, John him with wingers, uh, running past, in behind, supporting. Um, it, it it really does help in wide areas, and, and I'm excited to see how we uh, progress with that. It'd be difficult to keep hold of him, I think. Um, but I don't think he's done loads to say, you know, he's a player that, that a team needs to take a, a, a punt on. Um, I think that'll all determine in the next, you know, you know, well, the, the, the first half of the next season. Um, hopefully to see you know if he kicks on because he should be doing in that league you know in, in League One he should be a, a big 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 player um, with the way that he, um, the way that he's played this year. I think we're quite fortunate in that he's, he plays for Northern Ireland and it's no sort of disrespect yeah. to Northern Ireland but you know they're they're quite happy to pick players from League yeah. One if they have to yeah. so you know like Mikhail Helic will probably have to move to get yeah. back in the Poland squad you would think whereas Brody Spencer wouldn't so there's not yeah. there's not that angle that we have to worry about. Um, but for me, he's been brilliant. I think the the only sort of question I've got at the minute is if Michael Duff plays the three five two system, which he did at. Um, I can't do with three five two. I hate it. <laughs> you and I Killer should, it. Should, should get together and just whinge about three five two. I hate, Tan, I hate Tan, it. Mate, Tan, I'm playing it. three five two with you in goal. What's do you not? Did you not like it then? Lloyd, Lloyd, really? Lloyd at left wing. Lloyd at left wing back. Andy Holdsworth right with. Steve Yates, Nathan Clark, Effie Sodji in front of you. Ugh, maybe a little bit, but not not always. No, I hate it. I hate it. It's. Uh, I'll be honest. I've I've not it. played to the same level you have, but defenders are all over the shop. When when I played when I played, you know, sort of county level, defenders had absolutely no idea what to do in a in a back three. They don't know whether to go wide with the man. They don't know whether to stay yeah, central. Yeah. It, 
it, and that's why you have to be above me. Yeah, yeah, that's why you have to bug me because really that that's your goalkeeper's role. That sometimes players are going to be out of position, and it's keeper's role to make sure that they they get into the areas where they need to be, or if they don't go out yeah. and they're holding areas and where they're holding. And and it God it used to just drain me. Uh, but you've got to, I think you've got to have some really versatile players to play that formation. I think you really well, do. Well, this is why I'm, I'm mentioning Brody Spencer because he could play right centre back or right yeah. wing back. But I don't think either is quite as suitable as a right back in a four, is it? So, but what about Turton? Turton, yeah, I mean Turton's really good as a spare defender, isn't he? But he's, he's good as a covering defender. Um, would you want? Player. Yeah, would you want Ollie Turton playing centre back and picking up a Sam Cosgrove type striker from Barnsley? You know, it is. But would you a... play? But, but, but would you? Would you? Well, I'm talking about Ollie Turton for right back. Oh, Ollie Turton right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a back four, right back. I mean, Ollie, you don't, you don't get better options than Brody Spencer and Ollie Turton in League One at right back. No. Do you? That, that's that's a phenomenal. Um, partnership phenomenal, of, um, bloody hell, phenomenal, phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. We're phenomenal. Going up, I'm telling you. for League One, yeah, for League One, <laughs> right back sorted. We, we good, we've got everything sorted there. We've even got a young lad in Neo Eccleston who can play in the uh, the pizza trophy as well, who's, who's pushing through. So, you know, it's not not bad at right back, it's perhaps the other no, side exactly. which is yeah, going to be uh, going to be questionable, but yeah, um, just quickly on the academy as well, um. Nagel, uh, there's been a, you know, we're recording this on the 30th of May and there was a video diary from Kevin Nagel today, which which is interesting and worth watching. Uh, and he mentions in this, um, I, I always find Kevin's really good. He, when you're planning something, he's really good at the start and really good at the end. So he knows he knows what he wants and he knows what it what the finished article looks like. But in the middle, he's a little bit grey and vague sometimes um, yeah. with with how you get there. And that's, I suppose, where Jake Edwards and, and whatnot comes in. But he did he did say, and I don't know if, and hopefully I'm not taking it out of context, but he, he kind of said he wanted the academy to go to the highest level, which is Category 1. Um, and Huddersfield Town have obviously never been Category 1. It was Category 2 uh, before it was closed down. And it, it's a lot of ambition. It's a lot of money as well. It's a, it's Was it two and a half million a year, I think, in terms of money? that what it is now. Spent? Uh, that's what it was in, in 2017 when... Um, I was involved. It was about two and a half million. So I don't know what it is now, but, and it's so many hours. The coaches have got to do so many hours as well and things like that. It's, it's, it's very, but I, I've always been of the, the opinion you either do it properly or, or not bother. Do you know what I mean? Well, so, uh, so I'm, I'm quite excited to see that they, they want to do it properly. And there are success stories. I know, I know it's tough. And Dean Hoyle always used to go, Oh, Man City, you've got so many scouts and, Man United are, are over, over there, Leeds are that side, Sheffield Wednesday are below us, and et cetera, et cetera. And it is tough. And Huddersfield are prisoners to geography in some ways, you know, in terms of academy. But also, there are opportunities there where, where they miss certain things as well. So, you know, Lewis O'Brien's come from Rochdale, you know, and we've had all sorts of sucks. Ben Jackson came from Stockport. My mate Dave brought uh, Ben Jackson and... Um, a, Dave. Brought, yeah, my mate Dave, Dave Illingworth brought Ben Jackson to Huddersfield Town with um, two others from Stockport Boys under 14s. Um, so it, it's doable. And you look at Wigan. Wigan have had a really good academy until they, they hit the financial issues of the other year, where they, which was really bizarre. But until then, they had, you know, Joe Gellart coming through. They had. Um, they had Joe Gellart coming through, didn't they? And they had. Uh, who was so you're the, not telling uh, me all these, all these kids aren't even local kids that we've got? Not. Some of them aren't. No, um, there's a couple of Huddersfield lads in like at Liverpool and Man United and stuff. Um, so you it, know what I mean? it, it's, it's swings and roundabouts. Even when it's... we had an academy, we still weren't bringing it local kids. What's the point? Get rid of it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. It, um, it's, it, it's for me. It, honestly, it's it's one of the best things you could hear uh, to happen. Um, I know Worthy's absolutely buzzing with it, and and mm. he will make it. You know, he's had some. He's got a lot of experience in and around this now. He knows what it needs to look like. He knows what he wants um, in terms of the kids, local kids. I know things are obviously pushing away now behind the scenes to to get kids in and you see things on social media where kids are signing. It's just brilliant. It's great to see young kids wearing the blue and white shirt again at, at ages 9, 10, 11, etc. Um, and and when my son's in, in, in an academy set up and there's a lot of there's a lot of good, really good academy setups that really, really, really look after the kids. And for me, 
that's the first and foremost. You know, we've spoken before um, behind these things about opportunities for kids now and coaching and things. And, and there's a lot of private academies with some excellent coaches, mm-hmm. um, probably better than coaches, you know, in, in, in academies because, you know, it's, it's better pay, etc. So I just thought that we get it right and, and we get, you know, some really good people in to, to coach our young local boys um, yeah. and girls as well, obviously, you, you know, how it, yeah. how that progresses, I don't know. But, um, I, I think it's really important for this area, you know, a place where our young kids can, you know, can strive to be, you know, a, a Huddersfield Town player and play on, you know, on the ground down there. And, and, and that's what dreams are made of. Uh, and I'm yeah, so absolutely. glad that they're, 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 they're pushing forward with it. I mean, I remember last time, I think it would be four years and years ago, it, it was a million pounds to keep it running. And I remember Jerry used to do all sorts, yeah. you know. My mate's yeah. dad, Gary Woolley, used to sponsor us on a, on a night for FA, uh, for FA Youth Cup games. We used to go to, um, we used to go to Johnny's for, for some food. <laughs> Not, not for any music, for some food before the game. And it was all really, really special and stuff. And, you know, it's um, a lot of local business. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll come out and support it. And rightly so, because it's, you know, it's a massive part of our local community. Yeah, I mean, on that, my, my son's six and he's in a, one of the, pri- you know, he goes to one of the private academies over in, yeah, over yeah. in Leeds. And, I mean, he's, I mean, at the minute he's sort of, he, he's starting to play under sevens next year and he's he's decent. He's not. Um, I'm not sure how good he is or anything yet because it's difficult, isn't it, at that age? But he's probably yeah. like borderline where yeah. um, someone will come and look at him, kind of thing. He's, he's a little bit small for his age, so I think that usually counts against him, doesn't it? But he's, um, yeah. But for him, Did you see he, the coach he's, well, just coach. Yeah, well no, it's, it, uh, exactly. Well, he's it, unfortunately he's, he's grassroots coach. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, I've heard. <laughs> but uh yeah he's um but yeah but but for him if he if he ends up being good enough to have the option of playing for his favorite team Huddersfield Town yeah, is, is is great even if he does yeah. live over in in Leeds you know I mean his favorite yeah, team still exactly. Huddersfield Town so you know it, you know it's it's fantastic to have that that back um and like I say Wigan and Blackburn are really two good examples of how to run an academy in the shadow of you know your Manchester clubs Blackburn's mm-hmm. academy is phenomenal it's phenomenally good and Tony Carr's is one man who did an, an amazing job there, and I, and I remember when he's at Huddersfield, I thought Tony Cars was brilliant, and he was a a big loss, I think, to Huddersfield Town. Hopefully, and Wigan, is that Villa now, isn't he? Yeah. yeah, he's at Villa and Wigan Academy. There's some fantastic footballers there. Yeah, I don't know what they do with their coaching, but my little lads played against those boys, and mm. they are fantastic footballers, and, yeah. and they they get a lot of the boys from Liverpool, Manchester, etc. So you know, there's there's a spread of, of kids, but they they do a fantastic job. Their facilities aren't amazing. Um, but they're, they're getting something right, and, and and hopefully, you know, you know, they can get a few of their players into their first team too. Yeah, absolutely. I think the last thing uh, when we talk about academies is we now need to do the annual award of the Phil Senior Mick Wadsworth Tribute, uh, which is is technically the Young Player of the Season. I've, I've kind of put Young Player of the Season and the the breakout together into one because it's technically the same same sort of thing and I think that's the only I, thing I've ever won at the club <laughs> the young player of the season it's yeah, yeah, more, yeah, more than most people from Kirk Burton and Kirk Eaton put together <laughs> so, there you go uh, right so uh, let's have a look for the Phil Senior Young Player of the Year where are we Phil Senior Mick was with Young Player of the Year right okay so we allow people to uh, so the, the options were Jacob Chapman um, who kind of reminded me of you a little bit, Phil, when he played against Middlesbrough, you know, sort of like frame wise and, yeah. you know, saving a couple of things that you probably didn't expect, you know, some of his yeah. height. He did to well, didn't he? Save. Yeah, yeah he did really well. Um, yeah, really happy for him. He's in the mix. Jaheim Headley, Tom Yapenda, he's a player I'm really excited to see next year at a lower level. I think he could really be yeah, a surprise him, package. Yeah. yeah, I think he could really be a surprise package. I think he's a smashing player, uh, Tom Yapenda. Uh, ben Jackson, Pat Jones, Bro dispenser, uh, and then two options have been added by town fans who filled in the oh. the, the uh, filled in the the, the, um, the form. Uh, one of them's put Kyle Hudlin, which is fair enough, uh, and the other one's put Darren Moore Junior, which I don't really understand, but I don't know who Darren Moore Junior is. But <laughs> there you go. So we've got in. Uh, We've got one vote for Kyle Hudlin. I'm, no. I'm, convinced, I'm convinced it's Lee Morris, but he denied it. Um, we've got two votes for Tom Yapenda. 
Two votes for Ben Jackson. Three votes for Pat Jones. Uh, one vote for Darren Moore Jr., which I'm still struggling with. Uh, and 95.6% of the vote has obviously gone to Brody Spencer. And, and, I, thought ben, and, I thought Ben Jackson did well last year. I thought he did, he did all right. He had a good spell, didn't he, when he played right back? Yeah. He, he, did, he had quite a good yeah. spell, yeah. And Headley had a good spell at some point as well. Um, yeah. Pat Jones, Pat Jones is one that always kind of disappoints me because he's got so much talent, doesn't he? Um, he's got. He, he's balls, obvious, oh yeah. He just. It's just his hamstrings tend to go, and or he's, he gets little injuries or mus- musculoskeletal injuries, and hopefully next year that he, he he kicks it and you know he can push on because you look at some of these kids and coming into next year and the drop in level and the ability to play in the uh, Bristol Street Motors Trophy, you know, and actually get meaningful games for the football club you're employed by. Yeah. You know, you're looking, you're looking at people like Yapenda, you're looking at Pat Jones and and Neil Eccleston and uh, and you know maybe Michael Stone and and whatnot, and you're thinking, you know, now Town are back at this level with you would expect. One of my criticisms, or, or I won't say criticism, more of an observation about Town is it's been difficult in the Championship to bring young players through because the quality of the first team doesn't help elevate them. If that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, so when a, when a young player comes through, he needs like minders and people to look after yeah. them and, and things like that and when a young player's coming with town they've had to kind of like run you know hit the ground running the you know because if you have one weak link in the chain for for us in the uh whereas league one i think we've there's probably going to be a little bit more rope in in yeah. that in that in that respect so i think we could potentially see a lot more breakthroughs uh in league one with 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 some of these young lads and i'm excited by it phil i am mm. um Brody Spencer is is quite quite rightly won this with ninety five point six percent of the um, of the vote, and I think that's a, a quite phenomenal yeah. thing and, and a well deserved. Clear, clear and obvious. So, yeah, congratulations to to Brody yeah, for well winning the and he takes that chance. Phil Senior, Mick Wadsworth make, tribute. Make sure you stay players. at the club and get it again next year. Will it be young next year, or will it be? Yeah, will it be, yeah, it be a season pro next year. He might get Player of the Year next year. He could, he could yeah. get the double. Do you know, Jack Radoni yeah. technically qualifies for Young Player of the Season, but I thought he might be in the shout for the main one, so I didn't really want it to be a case of him winning both. I yeah. thought it should really go to a genuine, you know, young Plus, player. if rumours are true and he's got a Coventry, then he doesn't deserve one at all, does he? <laughs> there you go. Send him to Coventry. <laughs> uh, last last two things, Phil, that I've got on here. Um, obviously, you've Sniffed around the uh, the Barnsley Metrodome every now and then. Um, yeah, there must be there must be some thoughts on Michael Duff that you've picked up from from people. Yeah, um, I, 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 obviously I speak to there's a lot of parents there that, that are big Barnsley fans, and they were really impressed when he was at the club. They really liked him. Um, so uh, we're not spoken in loads of detail about him, but they just they, they liked the way he played. It was an attacking style of football. Um, and and yeah, so it, it was. It's all it's all positive. It's all really positive. I mean, he's, when his name was were, were circled, circulated before, and and obviously um, he, he didn't get the job. It was it, it was well thought of then. So um, hopefully, it's it's pretty positive. I mean, for a, for a Yorkshire football fans, and you know how dour Yorkshire people are, and Barnsley fans are as dour as anybody out there in some in a negative, if you like. But for, for them to be largely unanimous in the liking of a manager must mean he must have yeah. done a good job and must be decent. So But I think it, it's got to I think it's got to that point, hasn't it, where where it's you know, fans just wanna fans some what fans want someone who they can trust. And I think this guy's obviously done it at Barnsley, he got a good move to, to Swansea, you know, he's he's got those attributes there. So I think I think he, he seems he seems like a normal a normal appointment and I think fans are happy with that you know it's not this Darren Moore where there's been all this surrounding him and, and Carlos Corbin where people are you know are unsure I think it's just it just feels like a normal a normal manager what I really like about it though is when when he came and you can tell he really wants this job as yeah. well and that that's yeah. what really stood out for me is that Andrew Brighton right it was I think he came uh, maybe well, the financial package was quite good for him yeah. and he, he seemed a little bit uh, ambivalent to stay, and obviously he, come, he didn't want to stay at the end, um, which yeah. is which is fine. Um, but Michael Duff wanted this job; you could tell. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, and that's what that's what kind of excites me is he wants this job. He's going to live, you know, if, whether he lives in Cheltenham or whether he lives in Huddersfield, etc. Yeah. He's going to live and breathe Huddersfield Town twenty four seven, and that excites me. It reminds me a little bit of Lee Clark. You know, Lee Clark was very much like that. I know people have got, um, mis- you know, misforgivings with, with Lee Clark. But but, what you want? I, I want, was, I want my players. 
I want my players and my coaching staff and my management, I want them round here. I want them living in the area. I want yeah. them taking in and, and, and living and breathing it all and, 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 you know, understanding what it's all about. For me, yeah. I think that's massively important. I think he does, doesn't he? He lives, he lives here during the week and then I think on Sundays he goes back and sees the, the yeah. wife and kids. I think he's... I think he's, he said he's got daughters who are sitting in the GCSE, so you can kind of oh, understand, right. can't you? Yeah, yeah. So you can kind of I mean, understand that, that it's, upheaval. It's, 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 is it, where they, you know, Rafa Benitez, yeah. where they have to up and, up and, you know, bring their families over, so, but, yeah, um, yeah, I'm pretty excited That's for it. I'm hoping. It's not I'm, too bad. There's motorways. Motorways exist. It's not too bad. Ah, uh, and the last thing is, uh, and I'm asking everyone on this, just your thoughts on Kevin Nagel's first year as Huddersfield Town owner. <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. It's, it's just been a little bit random. I feel, I feel like there's been mistakes made. Um, like I said again, um, I'm not a massive fan of the social media input. I'm really not. I think that you, you need to, you know. I think you know Dean Hall's a prime example. Dean Hall spoke when he needed to speak, and that was it. And he's a massive town fan. You know, bigger than you know, as big as all of us. So, I, I, I like that. I think the, the, the chairman stays out of the way, but. I don't know. I really don't know. I think I feel like different, it's different I, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I feel like and it's different countries, so they obviously have different ways of, of working, etc. I feel like he's got I feel like he, I feel like he's got the club's best interest at I really do. Um how he brings that across, I don't know, but I really do feel like he wants to please the fans. I don't I don't think you always need to please the fans to be honest. Because you know we've got to we've got to trust the specialists, don't we? You know, fans, I mean, the fans of the club. We've got to there's trust. No, there's no pleasing Huddersfield fans sometimes, so you there's have to no bear that in mind. Any fans, though, that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. No any fans, so it's you of know you're always going to get that when when you when you're asking for the opinion of thousands. You know, you're going to get loads of different feedback out. You know, people want yeah. season tickets to be to be prolonged, and they want them less. But then we want to spend more money on players. There's all these different things, and 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 I think as a chairman, it's really difficult. And I think he. He needs to stick to his guns and what he envisions his club to be. I like the fact that he wants it to be a place on a weekend where um, people feel at home and, and it's quite lively, etc. Um, if he wants to improve like the sales in merchandise and stuff, brilliant. Um, but first and foremost, he's just got to get it right on the field. He's got to get the academy right. Yeah. He's got to get he's got to get the club right on the field, and and his this staff as well. So his backroom, not not so much backroom staff, but the people in the offices, you've got to make sure they're happy because, you know, happy staff makes happy players and, and, and things go around the pitch and that's from my experience anyway because when things aren't going well at a club and, and, and everybody's not happy, then it's um, it's it's just a sinking ship. So I he think he's got a the, big... Go on. Yeah. He talks about the culture, doesn't it? And the culture runs the whole yeah. way through the club, doesn't yeah. it? That's, that's it. Massively. From, from, the, yeah. from the, the, the main man at the top to, you know, the people at the bottom like, yeah. like me. Like that, your volunteers and what have you, everyone, yeah, the main, main people, yeah. The, I mean, the, the people on the ground are the people that do the, the best work, 100%. The 100%. They're, they're the ones that keep keep the ship going, so you know, they're the most important people at the club. It's not the players, the players do the job on a on a weekend, but those people are going to be paying down, yeah, yeah, exactly. Fantastic, right, Phil, thank you very much. That's uh, that's the end of An absolute of pleasure season, season renew review and uh, and uh. All the best to everything in Cape Burton. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>
shall be a memory So town play up And bring that car Back to Huddersfield So town play up And bring the car Back to Huddersfield